Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. It's been like forever since we've done a live show with a guest, Sam. I don't even remember who our last guest was. Probably uh, gonna put... We'll just pretend it was one of the most successful ones. Hey, do you remember when we had Gary Braun back on? Who? <laughs> we are joined Sorry, today uh, by a guy who um, actually swam in, in the same pool as I in the literary community for a long time and who has uh, picked up the reins of something that's deeply, deeply important to me personally. Um, we'll get into the whole story, but first, please, just welcome to Eric J. Gennard. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and for having me on, Lauren and Sam. So I, I, this, we'll talk about your writing at, in, in due course, because it's obviously a uh, just a titanic part of your world and probably led you to the anthologies anyway. Um, yes, it did. But at the moment, we are right on, on the cusp of the release of something that looks something like that. Uh, the Horror Library, Volume 8. And we're going to... Uh, listen, this is self-serving as it might seem. This is definitely a hype machine for that book. Um, you've just spent a, the better part of a couple of years on this book. Yeah, I, 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 the, for this particular volume, I spent about a year on it. Year? And, that, and that includes uh, sourcing for the artwork. Um, this book has a gallery of illustrators. So I'm kind of running out on a template off of my, my last volume. So I like to have all of the background constructions, everything already put together, the framework, so that I can then go into the submission period and requesting all, all the stories and start kind of building everything into it. And it's a, it's um, well, I don't know if it's a gorgeous book. Let's, let's find out. Look what came in the I mail like today. So every parent thinks their children are gorgeous. <laughs> so, so this, I have not seen the book in the flesh yet. It came, my contributor copy came in the mail today. Wait, I'm you got a open... flesh bound book? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, it was it's like the Willy Wonka golden ticket. It's just like the, the one special one that was sent off to the world Sam, and Lauren acquired it. If, if, if you would like one, you need to write a story for volume nine. Oh, but I, I want to make sure that I get the flesh bound book for sure, though. <laughs> I don't want it to be bound in my flesh. I want it to be bound in somebody else's flesh. Can I make that request? Is it like a bespoke cover? I'm not going to open that envelope. But here we go. And bam. Oh, that's oh, lovely. Looks good. The Postal that's... Service did not destroy it. Show the thickness. Show the thickness. We want the girth. This is this is spine. I want the nice. spine. There we go. So yeah, um, handsome as always. It's a series that has always looked good, in my opinion. Um, and we'll talk about how, how the importance of this series in the small press at some point too during this conversation. I love the cover. Um, there's always a risk with co horror covers, right? You make it too prosaic and no one cares, and you make it look too much like a skeleton cheerleader, and we all just think we're in the 80s. So no, this I think is Fear Street. That's okay. Wait, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, I, is... like, I like the imaginative horror, or something that, that kind of tells a, a, a more subtle imaginative story on, in and uh, on its own. I want to know why she has the hole in her back. Did it come from i mean is she on a blind date with the skeleton is that how she got the hole in her back or did they meet on a dating app and she had the hole in her back and the skeleton dude was who she sw matched with so many ideas i could have a whole anthology of stories just based off of that artwork very true, oh, very true. tell me what it means so eric let's start at the beginning how'd you get bit by the horror bug <sighs> The long version or the short version? We got an hour. All right. Well, all right. I was born in 1975 and from the beginning. No, I, I really enjoyed the horror since, since I was a child. And I always trace my original horror roots probably to the old black and white um, Twilight Zone. Um, I, I think that was probably the first time sitting at home on a sick day from school and, um, you know, wa watching the, the reruns. And uh, for the first time, like seeing episodes on TV that actually like scared me, 
I've been scared before. I remember like Scooby Doo cartoons, the little the monsters, the headless horsemen chasing after that. Um, when you're like a youth, I mean that was terrifying. But as like you, know, you start to get a little bit older and you, you shed the cartoon fears, but the Twilight Zone really started to delve in to re real fears. I mean, the one of the first episodes I saw dealt with. Um, a Nazi going back to the concentration camps that he once ran and having to encounter the spirits of those that he tortured and murdered. And, oh, my God, for somebody, I was probably only in, like, fifth grade when, when I saw <laughs> that. But the, the horror of that message and the strength of that message was just so compelling that, naturally, I wanted to see more. I wanted to see more on that because it – it told so much. I mean, and especially as a child, there's there's certain things that you you might be shielded from. And I was kind of raised in a more conservative household, and I wasn't really allowed to go and watch rated R movies, that uh, Nightmare on Elm Street or, or Friday the Thirteenth um, types of movies. So, um, seeing the episodes of the Twilight Zone, and then later on, Tales from the Dark Side was another huge one um, that really started me on the path. And from then on. I started to read horror and uh, Stephen King as, as most horror writers of, you know, of middle age years. Hey, 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 say, hey careful, careful read, there. That's Stephen King. So that, that was my first reading Stephen King. And I, you know, I, I could not get enough Dean Koontz, um, Anne Rice. My father read these books and his grandmother actually would read them first. And then, or my grandmother being his mother and then pass the paperbacks down to him and he would read them and then he would pass them down to me and, and I would read them. And, um, essentially I was hooked and I, I always, I liked writing and I liked making up my own stories as I grew up. But by the time college hit, I kind of shuffled those things aside because I was really told I needed to go, go into business. And, you know, I would never make a career being a writer and I wanted to have a family and a, and a house. Um, but then I got back into horror anyways, I lost my job and I lost all my money. So it was all for naught. So I decided to go, go pursue my passions and, in later years so i was i jumped back into it and i was really very saddened when i looked back and i thought that i'd wasted like 12 14 years of my life not pursuing it i don't know did i answer your question i kind of went down a, a roundabout memory lane so we went down uh, the rabbit hole deep enough that watership down is looking up at us but th but i love that um I th you know, it's funny. I think we are such of the same generation. It's it's scary. I was born in 73. So, I mean, I have a little bit on you, but all those cultural artifacts of the 70s into the 80s that are part of my memory, I'm sure are part of yours, even though geographically we're a country, we're nearly a country apart, right? So I think it's fascinating that there's entire generation that have the same touchstones. Mm -hmm. And you're right. You know, when I discovered horror that had relevance to the real world, was the point where I knew I was in it for the long haul. Um, I'm a fan of the Universal Monsters. I'm a, I'm a fan of like giant bug movies from the 50s. Yes, but I'm I I think like Val Luton's stuff in the 40s actually was what really uh, when I found those films, film films like Cat People. Oh, um, it changed everything for me because I was becoming a little bit older by then, and this the fact that there was an intellectual side as well as all the scary cool monster stuff, right? Uh, that that was huge for me, um, but yeah. So that first season of Tales from the Dark Side completely uh, co-signed all the way. <laughs> As the series went on, it, it didn't stay at that level, but I mean that first season is so tremendous. Yeah, yeah entertaining and really there was a point in the eighties when there was just tons of these anthology types of of shows. I mean, Amazing yeah. Stories was, was mm -hmm. another one, and then Tales from the Crypt was was going on. And the new Twilight was, Zone. Yeah, then the yeah. new the new Twilight Zone. There was just such a, a dearth of of just wonderful imaginative stories and that that's what that's what really struck me is that i could i could go watch a show anytime and it just told me a very unique story from somebody's point of view and i didn't have to have been around and seen the previous week's show and it it wasn't a continuing soap opera and it wasn't something long but just in a little half hour or an hour increment i got to sit down and escape into something that was completely, it was fantastic. 
it was outside of, you know, I got family ties and silver spoons going <laughs> on and, you know, one part of my life. And they're, they're really examining the real world dilemmas of, of youth and families of a certain subsect of, of American <laughs> culture at that point. But then all of a sudden in the evening was, was the, the horror, the science fiction, the fantasy, just, just more of the escapism. The, the, uh, we'll move on from television in a second, but um, I'd be uh, a big part of my childhood was the one season of Dark Room, which was an anthology series that was um, mostly written for the screen by Robert Block, but he yeah. actually was, um, he, I mean, people, he was taking people like, uh, um, well, Robert McCammon and Nolan, and he was adapting all these at that time fairly current. I mean, uh, writers, I wish we had something like that today. Like, how awesome would it be if there was a horror library television series? Because it's kind of what you're doing, right? I mean, in a way. Yeah, very very awesome. Um, I love the animated series, um, Love, Sex, and Robots. I feel like I said one of, one of those wrong. <laughs> no, I think you got it right. Yeah, that's um, and that's that's capturing a lot of indie horror short stories and and translating them um, in animation, which is really fun in in and of itself. But I kind of look at that as as almost an equivalent for for horror library, um, not as much of a depth as as I would like to see. And of course, they've never approached me for my for horror <laughs> library story. So obviously, there is a void that needs to be filled in that market. But I. I do love that that series at least. Uh, I like that idea simply because just by my, by simple division, I have a good chance of getting attacked. <laughs> um, but let, so you decide that you want to do the writing. You you want to be part of that world. You want to create. You want to add something to to the genre. How old were you at that point? When I when I started writing for the sake of publication, I was at the age of I just turned thirty five. Okay. And what were the first moves like? I mean, did you go out, go to Raylan.com and see what was uh, looking for stories, or did you just sit down? I didn't and write? even know about Raylan at that point. <laughs> I literally hit the Google search search engine um, at Bing at, at that point. I mean, whatever they had uh, 12 years ago, besides besides Google. I before I started writing for horror, I was I was I was unemployed. I was out of work, and I was actually very interested in like genealogy. My in the, the study of family history and I was writing articles for genealogy and I was in school on a master's degree for public administration and I had an interest in um, ecology so I started writing academic articles and I was Yahoo had an old pay-per-click model that if you uploaded um, essays and articles you would get paid directly by the amount of clicks that people would go on to it so I started uploading articles, and so that kind of laid the foundation of writing, even though it wasn't related to fiction. But that kind of opened the doorway that I realized, you know what? I suddenly understand that I have the power of essentially self-publishing, you know, self-publishing um, essays at, at, at that point. And once it kind of, it was kind of the bug that got me started because then you know I would start I would start tracking the sales and articles and I would say why did this article have a thousand clicks but this article only had five clicks was it the topic was it that somebody had shared it and that person had a bigger audience and then while I was doing that I suddenly realized you know this is kind of boring like I I like looking at the background of these things but the articles themselves, I'm just doing it for the sake of doing it because I thought maybe I could make a little money, but I don't really like writing nonfiction. I'm going to try my hand at fiction. So I started to kind of write and post online fiction stories. And then from that point, I thought, oh, my gosh, I suddenly <laughs> realized it dawned on me that I love writing again and I want to see my work published, but I don't want to just publish it myself on these blogs. So then I did hit the Google or the the um, Ask Jeeves. That's the one. That's the one I used to use. Is Ask Jeeves. My back, age. Back, back in the day. Like, literally, where can I publish my, my horror um, writing? Because I was a lover of anthologies. And my my um, shelves, my bookshelves back here are filled with horror um, anthologies of 
whispers and borderlands and all kinds of cemetery dance and i got masks back there and ellen about shadows best of yeah all the best of i started thinking like i yeah. want to publish it in these markets so yeah I, when that's when i started deciding well i want to write for the sake of publication now and that was again when i was about about 35 years old and um yeah I, but yes. going going through the googles that that's when I came across Horror Library. It was literally through Google. And that's where I learned about through Rollin and, and Duotrope at that at that time. And um, I started joining the online forums. Like Shocklines. Uh, yeah, the hey, Shocklines. Oh my gosh. That that was the one that, so, that was so that people was don't evil. People dead. Did, if people didn't experience Shocklines, I'll say I actually consider a period of indie and small press horror to be the Shockline years because it was the central location where everyone who was involved in midline horror all came to talk. And looking back now at the people we were interacting with on a regular basis, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was magnificent. And I think that's probably where like I was led through these Google and ask Jeeves searches is if you want to in publish in horror, talk on the, you know, join these forum boards. So uh, yeah. there was like several different forum boards that I ended up joining and just started putting myself out there. I didn't know anybody. I didn't really have any experience in like trying to um, publish in anthologies, but I just basically just jumped into conversations, started to get a sense of what people were doing that maybe I could kind of invite myself along on, on their coattails. So let's talk a little bit about Horror Library, what it is um, and where it came from. Um, in its earliest incarnations, uh, Boyd Harris, uh, RJ Cavender, uh, open for, for stories. And they're looking, I, I think they made it very obvious from that from the very beginning that they were kind of looking for thought-provoking horror that hadn't really been done before. They, they weren't really looking for the tropes. That first volume um, was not on my radar, I'll be honest with you. Um, but the aftermath of it was like people were buzzing off that anthology, even though, um, looking back, it's the one with the least name, like known names in it. It's yeah. The, there's no, it. really none. No, but, it. but that editorial approach was, uh, did make waves at that time. Cause I think people did want a shadows anthology or they wanted a modern day, either Carl Wagner or Charles L. Grant. They wanted that out there. And there really wasn't, I mean, we had, we, you know, we had the year's best thing and Ellen Datlow would reliably put two anthologies out every year, but there would be the same names in a lot of those, right? Here was something a little bit more democratic, it felt like. like It felt like if you submitted the Horror Library, you had a chance. Um, That's really interesting to hear your your um, perspective. I wasn't around for the first volume, um, the first few volumes, so I, I've never really kind of heard of that, the way that you put it. So that's, that's interesting um, background on it, to hear that to hear that there was a buzz and i know rj from his perspective everything was always a little bit bigger than maybe was was uh rightfully so you know from his his perspective it was this huge blowout that everybody loved and so it automatically led to a second volume and you know i take it with a grain of salt there had to have been something positive enough to have led to the second volume and, and the third volume so yeah. I, that is inter interesting to hear that kind of validation to it the second and third volume, you start seeing like bigger names submit and, and being invited and invited and coming on board. And um, yeah, I mean, you can see you can see this the, the brand really. In my opinion, the second book is where the brand actually starts to actually become the brand. Um, the first book is almost preamble, which I don't mean to insult anything about that book at all. It obviously nothing would have happened without its success. But that second volume in particular. Um, both for myself and for I think the line was very important. Yeah, it was just a, it's a different tone that you yeah. that you can see from between the first volume and a different tone to the second, and really a, a different tone to the third volume. And I kind yeah. of think while volumes, I like the half the stories in volume two I love and half of them I hate. But um, yeah, I feel volume two it was a great step step in the right direction. And I think from then on, three and four. Um, I, I were both very to me high level high level anthologies yeah. and whereas you know no no anthology that you read you're gonna love every story but i can at least look at the majority of stories and find value in them um in, in different ways and i can understand why they were picked but maybe i wouldn't have picked one but i could see that has some sort of compensating factor 
or that it would appeal to a to a different reader than, than my own. The other thing about these anthologies at that time is almost everything that was coming out in the anthology horror market was themed. And these were boldly saying, nope, not going to do it. Yeah. I sold my first thing I sold to the horror library is is a really dark, sardonic Western. <laughs> I mean, like, who's buying that, really? Unless you're going to buy, unless you're like a weird Western. But that my, my story's not weird enough for a weird Western. I love that story. That that was really one of my favorite stories in, in that volume. The um the, the pistol arrows. Yeah, story. yeah. Rain in the night season. Yeah. Uh, Death of the pistol arrow. Yeah, which um had had won a uh, the uh, Graverson Award from the Garden State Horror Writers, and then they wanted to publish it in their uh, anthology. And I I knew that like the total circulation of that anthology would have been like less than a hundred. And I just I, I believed in that story, and it won the award. So I was like. Sorry guys, I'm going to try and sell this elsewhere, <laughs> and it sold. And um, that was that was a big release for me because suddenly I'm on a table of contents with some pretty big names. Yeah, and that was it. Was it was really came down to like again those editorial decisions, and that it feels like even if you don't agree with every story or love every story, there's an integrity to it mm -hmm. that in the small press wasn't always the case. It always felt important to me. Um, so. Boyd eventually sells the the line um, to Patrick Beltran, mm -hmm. and uh, Patrick Patrick's a very important figure to me, as I think you're very aware. Well um, I think he had exactly the right intentions for the series. It was a bad time in his life to try and do it, yeah, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But the his his approach both in a new volume and the best of, and then uh, uh, Horror for Good, the, the charity anthology that I consider to be part of the series. I don't know if you do, but I do. Um, just a, a really well-meaning guy who really continued the legacy. And yeah. then the lights went dark. Enter. He had, he had the intention. He, he was one of the few that that actually he took the initiative to, to do his best to, to keep it going. And really, really without him, it probably would have just simply died out. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. And, but at that point, the lights go out and uh, there's a little bit of a pause and then enter you. Yep. So how did, how did, how did the idea of taking the series on come about and what was your initial ideas for it? Well, originally, well, Patrick had the series. He solicited me to be the editor of the series. So he did take it over and he reached out to me as since RJ had re essentially retired after after the best of and, and Patrick wanted to see the series continue, but he didn't want to be the editor himself. And so he reached out to me because I had already been editing other anthologies and because I was a former contributor in the horror library. So I had an, an appreciation for the series. So it, it was just, it was a nice transition. So I, I essentially, he just handed over the reins and said, put together volume six for me. And he offered um, oversight. And I I basically did it on my own, but just kind of made sure that he, he was happy with everything. And as he was, uh, and, and I was, I was happy with it. I really, I really enjoyed working with it, with him. And he was, he was very patient and always, um, you know, open to, to, to assist. And of course he covered all the financials in the background, which, which is a, a huge, Oh huge my God. Story. It doesn't freaking happen in the small press. Yeah. Right? yeah. No, no, he, was, he was, he was always upfront and honest and committed and uh, none better. The guy I can't really say enough about. Yeah, I really I'm do. responsible for it now. The financials. I'm like, ah, oh, it's the worst part of it. I can't afford it. I hate dealing with it. So having somebody else to alleviate that burden was immense, and I and I recognized. I was very appreciative of that because, again, I had done previous uh, anthologies, and yeah, to be able to partner with somebody else in, in that regard was it just it it took so much from me that I that he essentially just said, Eric, I just turn into the best anthology you can. So I got to look at it strictly from just a creative lens point. I was given a budget to work with. And from that, I could go through. And as we've done in the past, and I continue to do now, there's, I like to have a few slots that I save for invites for certain authors. And then the majority <laughs> of other authors kind of come out from the, the open call. 
Yeah. Um, but then unfortunately after the, after the sixth volume, I, I was caught up with life and so was Patrick. And then unfortunately, as you know, he, he, he contracted cancer and it, he, he fought it, but he wasn't able to, um, um, carry on. Um, but before he did, he essentially just said, he, he came to me and said, since I had already edited volume six and him and I had shared the love of the series that he asked if I would like to take on the series entirely, um, buying the rights and the name and with the hopes to just keep, keep putting forth volume. So, um, before his passing, he sold everything to me and I've put two more volumes out, um, since then. So hopefully as, as resources allow, I, I won't even say uh, while well, interest allows because I love horror and I love anthologies and I could easily do this for the rest of my life, but it's always more a matter of, of time and, and money. So how has it progressed for you since putting out six now we're on eight? So how has that experience been? Cause I, I mean, not having to deal with financial part on with part six, I guess that got a little bit more tricky with seven and eight. You don't have, I'm not saying disclose your financials or anything. Like <laughs> open up the checkbook right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I will open up the checkbook and just show you all the red numbers. <laughs> just, no, no, no. Hold it still so I can get the, the, the router and the routing number and the account number. We're good. Uh, it would be so sad. You would go through all that work for my routing account number and then you just find like the deficit. You would just be taking on my debts rather than moths fly out of the, 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 the tree. The moment yeah. you do that, your phone would Moth start ringing. Moths and ducks <laughs> just fly out. <laughs> no, I always tell anybody. I love talking about small presses and I love talking about anthologies. And I've mentored others and I always openly share my advice. Um, I'm terrible at business. Every anthology I've ever put out is a financial loss. And it's a horrible use of time and it's frustrating. And I literally I work like a second job just to pay out royalties and cover the costs. But I've done it out of the passion of it. It's just the passion of writing and being part of publishing and promoting um, others', others uh, writing. And I, I love doing it. So as far as volume seven and eight, it's just like all of my other anthologies. It's just a matter of, I have a small amount of money that I that I've saved up from from this job, and I budget it towards my next anthology venture. And I pay out everybody up front, and I never have enough royalties to offset what I've paid out. But I, I move forward and start start planning out the next one. Well, uh, well, on a happier note, I mean, like, does it get more progressive? Like, are you in, are you still continuing to enjoy it as much as you have before? Because you do. can do it for the rest of your life. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I look at it just like, you know, people who draw pictures, you know, you don't, at some point you might get tired of, of drawing or painting, but for most people you, you, you do it because you love doing it. And the same with writing. I write, I write because I, I enjoy doing it, but I also, I really love editing and I really love publishing for its own sake, you know? And, and again, I, I originally got into anthology editing because I wanted to promote something that had brought me so much joy growing up. And also because I looked at it as a venture that would make me a better writer. And I strongly uphold that. And I will, and it really has, and I really look at my, my own level of writing has, uh, it just, it jumped immense levels from the fact of looking at slush the amount of slush and reading and seeing the errors in what people are writing, seeing the flaws of the writing, not the gr not the grammar that they're writing, but the style, the context, seeing what people in their aggregates, the same kinds of stories that are coming across my desk that I look at and go, oh my God, I was writing just like this. And now I realize why this type of work is not being published because first of all, everybody else is doing it. And secondly, it's dull and it's played out. And thirdly, people are writing to what was being published two years before. You want to write and you want to emulate what you've seen, but you know, there's everybody was doing every the zombies were huge and everybody was doing zombies, but all of a sudden when zombies died out, you realize in the indie markets, people who are writing their submission, they're still writing the zombie stories. And the same thing with witches, and the same thing with vampires and serial killers. And now I see you know, stories that are coming across my desk is people that are writing from the heart. And I understand that, but they're writing about plagues 
and they're writing about their, their stories of self-quarantine um, and being trapped and stories about loneliness. And I understand that would due to COVID, but at that point, they're now they're just one of a thousand other um, authors that, that are coming across. So I've, you try to recognize that you want to write something that is more progressive, that's speaking about the topics of tomorrow while also being unique and trying to write outside of the box. It is trying to write either something that is just breathtakingly more beautiful and passionate and resonant than everybody else is or else coming up with a much more unique idea and story than other people are writing about. I probably went off on another real, real long tangent um, um, at, at no. that moment. As, no, that as was well. perfect. That was perfect. Because I do th I think this series has always fought against the normal. Yes. And it, I think that is kind of that editorial uh, slant that makes it special. You know, we talk on this channel, we talk, uh, we do talk about books a lot, but we talk about movies as well and, and, and comic books and a lot of different things in the horror sphere. And the, the funny thing is like, I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with people saying, Oh, we we're always looking for the new thing. We're looking for the new thing. This series has kind of always given us the new thing. Yes. And, and that's, why I think it it has a cult following and why it is important. Um, I won't lie to you. Like when I, when I, when, when I see that a, a horror anthology is a horror library anthology is opening. My first thought is, do I have anything that's, that's off, that's off the rails, but on the, on the track. And if I don't, well, I brainstorm and try and write something for it. Because it's a, the idea that I'll have someone receptive to new, which is not always true of every house, is exciting. Um, and then, you know, I mean, the other side of it is like, you have Bentley Little in more of these anthologies than not at this point. Yes. If you care about modern horror, that should put your antenna all the way up, Right. I'm so excited to be able to work with with Bentley Little um, on this, and it's another kind of happenstance pro providence that I had solicited a story from Bentley Little for a different anthology that I had worked on, um, even before Horror Library, because I've been reading Bentley Little since the mid '90s, and Bentley Little coincidentally lives just like ten minutes from from my house, and he went to the same school and the same college program that I went to. Although I've never met him, and he'll see to it that, I, that I'm never going to meet him. <laughs> um, and he has a P.O. box. I can't stalk him, but I, but he, he's so close, and I've, I've followed his career for decades. So I'd already been working on him. So then the chance to take over the horror library, which is really one of the, the few um, books that, that I'm aware of, one of the few series that he still publishes in, um, it was just such a, a wonderful blessing, uh, very serendipitous to be able to continue, since I already had that relationship, to be able to continue to reach out to him and say, you've been part of the horror library now, book after book, and you are really tied in so intrinsically into the series. It's hard to imagine putting out another volume without being able to shout, I have a new <laughs> original story by one of the kings of the bizarre and the imaginative being, being Bentley Little in book after book after book and everything he writes is um it's oh, he's, he's a fantastic author i guess for the discerning reader and he writes across so many genres it's, it's hard to like pick and say i love everything that he does but you can say everything he does is definitely very unique yeah i read because i i read mr honeycutt honeycutt in this <laughs> in this volume and it's kind of like a com it kind of is a combination of the cat came back, but what if the cat was made of rotten walnuts? <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea where this idea, where it came, where the where the thought came from. But I, you know, I was just I'm so uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable, but I'm also slightly confused because it's about a two foot high pile of rotten walnuts that's terrorizing this couple. <laughs> they were rude. I mean, I'm sorry, spoilers. But I mean, somehow he mails himself to them in a box. <laughs> and 
the husband shakes the box and it's full of fucking walnuts. <laughs> and instead of burning it immediately, he just throws it in the garbage. That's fine. Well, to be fair, no, I mean, that shit. I would probably have eaten the walnuts. So, I mean, <laughs> not rotten just, ones. Just, maybe. <laughs> I, I, like, I like walnuts a lot. I mean, they I might be but avoidable. Not rotten ones. That. You don't know that. Have you also, eaten a rotten walnut? I have a horse walnut tree in the yard. You're not supposed to eat those. They're supposed to be absolutely poisonous, but I'm thinking about it. No balls, you won't do it. Yeah, Live on the see. air. We'll see. <laughs> I, I, I ate that Carolina <laughs> Reaper on the I, I ate that Carolina Reaper on the air, so this is not impossible. Oh, I forgot um, about that. Yeah, that was bad. Uh, uh, that yeah, was I always have to ask like Bentley, like respectfully to kind of write <laughs> for a more general audience. <laughs> what, what he otherwise might write for, because if if you've read some of his other works, he has no boundaries. He no. will write the most grotesque, splatter, erotica, raunchiest thing <laughs> that you could ever like read. That you're like, oh my god, I, I can't even like. <laughs> I have to avert my eyes, but I have to generally kind of say, you know, I, I like the horror library to push boundaries, but only so far because I want this to be something that. You know, teenagers can read and a general audience can read without having to put a trigger warning like oh my god if you value your sanity don't <laughs> read this bentley little story because i i want to continue to promote bentley little who's wonderful in so many ways and i will say real fast sam since you asked about um you know where does he come up with his ideas whenever he sends me the story and if you were not aware he only corresponds with individuals via postal mail he does oh, aware. Email. He does not email. So I get a, a manila um, envelope with an old fashioned typewritten story that I have to like scan into my computer and like redigitize and, and edit from there. But he always gives a little note. Here's the backstory of this. And basically okay. he said, my car was in the shop. And I was sitting in the mechanics lounge and I had nothing to do in this. I thought of this story and I hope you like it. And from what he says in the legend goes, he writes all of his stories in one sitting, no rewrites, no putting the story down and coming back to it at another time. He just writes it off the top of his head. One take that there and then over the course of an hour, a, a couple of hours um, and, and shoots it off. So it's it's really funny the eccentricities. I, I don't know how much of that is accurate, how much of it is legend that's been built around it, but I'd like to believe all of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's we just can keep this, that this, legend going. Yeah, it's it's this mythology that he has kind of like built around himself and the other editors that are that have worked with him all express the same exact experiences. <laughs> the only thing that I can't stop thinking about in that Mr. Honeycutt story is because Mr. Honeycutt lives in this boarding house. Is there nobody else that has a nut allergy? Because, I mean, <laughs> boarders come and go. Somebody must, I'm sure it's not, there's got to be at least it's, one other it's, person. It's walnuts. We make exceptions, no matter who you are. Apparently. Or he stays in his room most of the time. He didn't go to the dinner table. Unless he wants to, like, yeah, you know, unless somebody brings him some chicken to eat, this yeah. pile of walnuts. Yeah, sure. The, the anthology also... Um, has a story from who, the guy I consider to be the most important modern horror short story writer and friend of the show, uh, Steve Tem. Oh my gosh. Yes. Steve Rasnick Tem is, um, he's a, a modern of, of the, of the modern world. He's a priceless writer. I'm, I've, I've been a huge fan of Steve Rasnick Tem as well for, for decades. So I was, as always, very, very happy to have um, published him in, in this. Coincidentally, the first story that I published of Steve Rasnick Tem was in an anthology called After Death. And it was stories of exploring what happens after we die across different um, mythology or beliefs. But that was also the same anthology that I acquired my first Bentley Little story. There you go. So, so it, it, it ties in. But yeah, I, I love Steve and Tem. And he is really kind of the opposite of, of Bentley Little. In that his <laughs> right. stories are always very quiet. He is such a quiet writer, and his writing is just so eloquent and gentle, and just 
the touch of the weird behind it and and the bizarre and you really had they're very thoughtful stories you kind of sit back and you wonder yeah i i get this but i want to reread it and see what what else that i'm missing because he has very subtle voices and layers that that go on in the background yeah he's a writer's writer in a lot of ways i mean he's the guy that you want to reread to see how did he pull it off yes and and that's always amazing especially since he kind of specializes in short stories and kind of ha has his whole career um uh it, he's one of those guys that has kind of perfected a form so every time there's a new tem story i'm there i'm every always time. i'm always excited yeah for, for steve tem so I'll, i'm going to share a couple of steve tem anecdotes i'd love that um real fast uh, on there so what i've when, when, lord when we were talking about first starting writing and um, going into the the forums and like reaching out to people and you know again I didn't know anybody and I was a no name and you know at the the point where I am in this profession not that I have any big name but I see lots of no names I see hundreds of people that jump up and say I'm a writer read what I have done and I and I note that you know they just published their very first story on a you know a, a no pay online blog exposure only. Yeah, but they're so excited. Which, which always for means it. no exposure. Yeah. <laughs> and if I understand they're so excited for it, and I and I recognize that because that was my path. I'd be so excited. But at, at this point, I, I also recognize how meaningless it is. Mm -hmm. And I also recognize that 90% of those people that are saying, look at me, I'm a writer. I just posted my first story are going to be done and out of this career after a year or two years. They're not going to continue um, for, for different reasons. So, but at that point when I'm a nobody... I reached out for the first anthology I did was called Dark Tales of Lost Civilizations. And it explored um, archaeologies and old mythologies and basically uncovering our past in modern ways. And I asked Steve Rasnick Tam, who I adore, <laughs> and I never had any conversation with, but I asked him for a blurb. And he was like, I don't know who you are, Eric, but it sounds like an interesting book. And I started a correspondence with him. So not only did he provide not just a blur, but like it was almost like a 500 word <laughs> forward to the book. And I was like torn because I'm like, I asked for a blur, but could I use this as a forward or should I just take extracts of it? And he was so kind and he started, he was the what, the first bigger name author that started to explain to me the background of like anthologies and I was already working on this anthology and I had been set with a publisher, but he was very patient and kind of making adjust, I should say adjustments to my expectations and making suggestions to me. And I really thought, man, this guy has so much going on um, at the time. He, he was still working full time at a day job back then. And then he was also writing and he had his family as his wife and, and his children and everything else that, that go along, goes along with that. But he was very open and communicative with me and would just start giving advice and sharing anecdotes and stories. And yeah, that meant so much to me for that story, um, for that anthology. So for the very next anthology, the one of the after death, he was like one of my first invites because he had been so gentle and um, generous with his time. And then secondly, be I had an idea years later to start a primer series which studies authors of the short story that I consider as modern masters. So when, when we in school talk about horror of the past, we are faced with here's Edgar Allan Poe stories. Here's H.P. Lovecraft stories. And we're kind of, sh it's kind of like the same light is, is shown upon the same authors in, in every school. So I wanted to explore and put out kind of textbook primers talking about these are the modern masters of today of the short story for contemporary writers that we could take a very, not a, a deep dive, but kind of just an overview of their overarching career. And these are writers who have been around for decades and they have won industry prizes and they have reinvented themselves and they are still writing. And so Steve Razak Tam was the very first author that I approached um, for that. So I did the Exploring Dark Short Fiction series, where I include a sampling of his short stories 
And then he also, I do an interview with the author. He writes an essay. I have an entire bibliography of his works. A oh, that, biography. That, 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 that could be a book in itself. Basically. Yeah. That, that's all that's all this is, is just, it's, a, it's an illustrated um, compendium. And there's um, academic commentary from Michael Arnzen, who's a PhD and an instructor of, of creative writing. So he goes in and gives, here's a little further background and, and exploration on each story. This is what it means in literary terms. And that's all I've been doing with these books is I promote them to libraries um, all over the nation and I promote these to book clubs and I promote these to high schools and, and to colleges. But uh, again, Steve Rising Tam was really an inspiration and he was basically, he was the first volume that I, that I went through that was kind of like an experimentation stage to see how I could do this and um, what it, and what it works out. And since then I've, I've put out uh, uh, five other volumes, six in total, and I'm working on the seventh currently. I don't remember a time when Steve, Tim wasn't someone I was reading. Yeah. I mean, he goes back to the first anthologies that I ever read. And that was, I, I read short stories before I read my first novel in the genre. So he's been there my whole yeah. life. Yeah. To me, Basically. Ben Little, Steve Resnick, Tim, Ram Ramsey Campbell, they've, they've been in these, the oldest anthologies that, I, that I've read and they're still writing today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I feel so privileged because my paths have crossed all the folks you just spoke with. I mean, so it's it's one of those things that the, when we have this wealth of creatives that are still with us, we need to find a way to celebrate them now. So I'm I, you putting out those primer books is an incredibly important thing as well as putting out new fiction from them because it's this genre in particular has a bad habit of there being I don't know, 20, 30 years after an important writer's death before they're reevaluated and they take their they're proper celebrated. pedestal. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that to happen to people, um, whether we're talking about, you know, my favorite living writer is Brian Hodge. Oh. We, we, need, we need to love Brian now. Not that he's anywhere near death because he's still a young man, really. But you know what? This is his time. We need to scream to the top of the heavens that we are incredibly lucky to have him. Yeah. Right? He's, people like Gary Brondeck, who, who at, a, at a very vulnerable time in the genre's history, shone bright and showed us where we could, how we could get out of the uh, shadow we were in. Which, because in, in mid '90s, late '90s, it all was starting to feel the same. And then here comes a guy who has completely different ideas, and and, and the chops to pull it off. Yeah, you know. So those are the guys that I just I I, I don't want there to be that gap. I want them recognized now. Uh, Elizabeth Massey is another one. Oh yeah, right. Like let's let's let Liz know while she's here how important she is. Yeah. Ah, she just got the Lifetime Achievement Award for her Writers Association this this year. I get so you. I, I like I, to think that she she feels it that she is appreciated and loved and, and valued at, at least. I, I completely get it, but um, she's one of those people that I don't think we could praise enough. Yeah. So I mean. And, and that leads you to your Kathy Kojas. And, you know, the, the list is a long list of writers. But when you really look at this moment, we're going to look back and say that was part of a new golden age that we didn't realize we were in. Yeah. So let's realize it. <laughs> and not for nothing, I think that Horror Library as a series is leading to the next golden age because it's a great vetting ground for the people who are going to take it forward. Um, it's great to see, like, people that we worship from when – from, from much younger years for you and I getting stories in there. That's awesome. Yeah. But the new names are almost more impressive. Like that, that 22 year old that sold you his first short story. That's a story I want to know, you know, that's what I want. And because I think that that's the heavy burden that people like Carl Wagner and uh, Charles Grant did for us as a generation. They would, those names were not whole household names at that time when he was publishing them, you know, so that's the other impressive side of Horror Library. Do you want to talk about anyone in particular that uh, you're excited about for this? Hit? Oh, man, as the editor, I, I don't I don't want to um, play play favorites on here. But, oh, gosh, there's so there, many. Well, no, but is there a story that, like, completely – if you if you could send a story to a year's Beth anthology, you could only send one. And and, it, and we're going to take me out of contention. Do not say me. I, I'm going to say – I'll come through you and of, slap you. But One of the stories I – Joe Kaplan – 
Mm -hmm. the pen name of Joanna Perry, Perry Pinsky. I think she's a phenomenal, phenomenal um, writer who is just getting better and better um, every year. And I've, I've published her before in previous anthologies, so I, I already have a, a rapport and a relationship with her. But I thought the story that she set for this anthology, when I first read it, I kind of said to her, I, I think this is almost too powerful for my, for Horror Library, because I'm proud of the Horror Library. And it gets certain recognition within indie horror authors, but in the, in the wider realm of some of the bigger magazines, like uncanny and, and nightmare mag and the dark, I, you know, I kind of started to suggest, I, I really think this is a story that would be picked up elsewhere where you, where you would have a greater audience because it just, it's such a beautifully written and a very, relevant powerful message that it, there's so much going on in the story that i thought i i don't know that i that i'm good enough for this but ultimately she said no 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 i want you to have it so i mean in, in my opinion that's that's something that i would absolutely see um reprinted in or at least as a contender for for ellen datlow and and also paula Graham for each of their year's best series um, and that story is called Broodmare. And I don't want to get, get too much into it, but it's essentially, it's kind of a, a fantasy tribe that's living on the plains and they live within a culture of horses. And it's a very small tribe, but they have, it's a very, there's a very subtle layering where they're essentially, it's the worship of horses and their new hope is the birth of kind of a mare that is both horse and human um and again it's it's more of this it's just told from the perspective of a teenage girl who's being forced to do things that that she doesn't um approve of I'll, I'll how are we getting to this mare that's half human and half horse yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, use your imagination and no it's not that terrible it's just actually no don't use your no, imagination. Don't use, i don't want to use your imagination in really different ways yeah, I, if you I, put I, an I, idea in sam's head it's more of cosmic it right? might not it's escape some like yeah bestiality bestiality thing i'm going on um cosmic like a tentacle no never mind <laughs> all right um i i love that one um teresa matsura is uh writing from japan and i've also published her before so i feel like sometimes there's writers that i've published previously that naturally i've published them and i because i admire their writing so if they're sending in in new material i just expect that i'm going to love it but it's not always the case i'm very deeply disappointed when sometimes writers have published before send in something for whatever reason it just doesn't appeal to me but i, I don't want to publish it just because i have a relationship with them and it would be impossible to anyways, because by this point I've published several hundred authors o over the decade of, of anthologies that I could not publish everybody. But um, so I always cross my fingers if I see an <laughs> author sending something in that I've read before and they say, oh my God, I love this story. And hers also, um, Teresa's story is um, called Zipperback. And it's essentially, it's body horror that's wrapped up around Godzilla. Ooh. And it's such a tragic, terrifyingly um, just sad, sad story, but just structured so beautifully um, within the message that, that she's telling. So I, I love that one. And there's just, there's wonderful, there's classic ghost stories. And as always, I try very hard to make it a point not to have two stories of kind of like the same trope or ideas mm -hmm. to it. So I may have one story that kind of bounds a little bit on the werewolf lore, but then I'll have another story that is completely imaginative um, by Colin Leonard about clay. And it's about an, a, a, a haunted mountain. Or I shouldn't say a ha not haunted, but a mountain that is, that is not appreciative of tourists and people taking taking parts of it away. Mother and there are stories yes. that are that are slightly Cthulhu. And um R.A. Busby um has one of the most traumatic stories that I've ever read of just a very natural horror of being trapped underground. Um that I literally just just felt like the claustrophobia just clawing um at me. I want um, that one next. I'm excited. Yeah, that 
Yeah, I read that one. That, very few stories um, that I read will actually like cause any like fear in my, in my mind, but that one is, and it does. It's not even really due to anything of, of a supernatural quality. But I don't, I don't want to give anything away if that's the next the next one on your radar. Oh, I'm gonna go through all of it. Don't worry, I'll get there. Uh, I read um. Well, Lord, I read yours, and like when I finished reading yours, Lullaby, like I was just. Man, fuck you, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you? That was my response. <laughs> but that's your response to most things I do. So I know. It's super fucking depressing. Uh, that's I, love, I love Lauren's stories because I think I, I mentioned this to you in our correspondence, Lauren, that your stories have a twist ending that's not like an R.L. Stein twist. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was it was a dream all along. But the story by its ending is suddenly thrown on its head by a completely different perspective that I can reread it and say, now I can see the direction that this was going towards all along. But on my initial read, it was just taking me down a different path that was worthwhile and scary and dark in a different way. But, oh, my God, the revelation. It's your revelations. You have some of the most strongest revelations in your short, in your short stories that I have always admired from the, the previous volumes. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um... Yeah, I always think of it as like, how can I make it worse fast? <laughs> but um, yeah, so I can't even tell you how proud I am to, to be. I'm pretty deeply linked to the series. Um, and it makes me extraordinarily happy to be able to continue that. Because I do think that this is a series that's tremendously important to the future of horror. It's exactly the right approach. It's not... You know, every time there's nothing wrong with picking up an anthology of, hey, look, it's romantic vampire stories. But we've done that. We've been there. They might be great stories. Don't get me wrong. And if you have an appetite for it, cool. But what this provides is a glimpse of where we could be in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. In some cases, way beyond that. Um, there are stories in this non entire series that um, come just haunt me in the middle of the day randomly. They, they flash to my mind and go, oh, you know what? it's that story that's what i'm thinking about and those are the best kind of stories i think it's easy to look at at the past in the genre and um think that the best days are behind us and that's exactly wrong and this is one of the few anthology series that consistently comes out there to kind of point that out that that, that there's so much bright i'm gonna use the word talent i don't believe in inborn talent i think you work for it yeah. but there's so many people doing such great work and in investing the hard the time to get the craft right to make sure their ideas resonate and then learn the humanity of writing which is something i, I was worried about in, the, in that weird 90s era where the humanity seems to be getting lost out of the genre yeah um and sometimes that was effective it was fine but it tended to be, i think it got too prevalent and the one thing i'll say about the the horror library consistently is you feel that it's crafted by human hands yeah. and that's the most beautiful thing for the genre. So is there any final thoughts that you want to put out to the audience besides the fact that there's a link in the description telling them where they can buy it on Amazon? Um, and I've, I've probably rambled so much, so much about it. Um, I, I'm very proud to be, be part of the series and to, to continue it. I'm hoping to start working on a, another volume in, in the near future. I've kind of put out a goal of, I don't want to push myself too hard. So I'm, I'm running it about every 18 months, a year and a half for a new volume. So I've started to kind of like look around for, for artwork for the next volume. And uh, I'll, I'm hoping to put out open calls for submissions next year and start, you know, basically running forward with volume nine. So if you're watching this, and you are a writer of any stature, whether, I mean, we have people watch this show, this show that are absolutely names in the genre. And then we have people who are aspiring or just learning the craft. The horror library is a great experience from a submission point. Because I, I, I don't mind having, I'm completely transparent. I don't care. The first thing I sent you, you said no to. And I'm glad you did. I mean, not because I don't love that story, but we got to the place we should have gotten to. And that was because you responded well and you provided that response and the guidance. Um, I don't think that you ever outgrow that. 
So having a great, great influence as an editor is timeless. If you're one of those writers who don't send them at just anything. Okay. Eric does want to not run and read your first draft of something that's not thought out, but he does want to read your absolute best. So keep an eye on his page. When he opens four subs, strongly, strongly suggest send him your best. The worst that's going to happen is you're going to end up with a good experience in hindsight. Yeah. And in the meantime, buy, his, buy the book, just buy it and consume the hell out of it. Yeah. And I always have authors that, that submit stories that I accept that say, wow, I don't know. I can't believe you accepted this. I don't know why I submitted it. It was just kind of a spur of the moment decision or I, or I didn't think you were going to like it. And those tend to be some of my favorite stories because they think, well, I don't know if this was really horror. I, I didn't think that it was going to be in your wheelhouse, but that's exactly what I'd like to read are the stories that are not necessarily a hard line horror but just the stories that take you to different paths that are, that are unexpected and that are progressive and they show the diversity of horror and they show how horror can be very subtle and small and slight imaginative ways, as well as being in your face with monsters and blood dripping occasionally. Although that personally has never been my preference, but I, I don't mind reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, take us home. But I'm home already. <laughs> yeah, I'm still home. Wait. <laughs>